Welcome to the Green Ring, and thanks for watching this note-by-note -note dissection of Wagner's Der Ring des Nibelungen. This video is second in a series of five which look at Das Rheingold Scene 1. Built on nearly two centuries of scholarly analysis, it's a massive journey I hope you'll take, never mind one I hope to complete. For an explanation of who I am, and more on the reasons for this series, please check the preface video. Links to all seven videos preceding this one can be found in my comment section. We pick up where we left off on the first stave of page 24 in Dover's full score. Albrecht's energetic response to the Ride Maiden's promise they'll let him know them. These vocalist measures are followed by their echo raised a whole tone as Alberich resumes singing, in a sped-up variant of the supporting cello line from the dwarf's hopeful first pleas to the nymphs, bassoons and contrabasses in thirds grumble a series of graced chromatic melody notes, while launched by reverse melody notes, cellos bustle through a series of chord note oppositions to rise on the original melody notes, an organized chaos of contrary syntactic pulls depicting the Nibelung's awkward scramble up the riverbed's crags. Its welter of grace notes already a Nibelung trademark, the chromatics a sign of his lust's intensity. This last syntactic bundle, Cook dubs Alberich's personal morphine. Though it sounds a mere three times after scene one, anything like this form, its seemingly random modular bundle certainly does repeat in that it's built from the epic's fundamental syntax. The core morpheme identified by Cook consists of a rapidly descending scale capped by reverse chord notes. Both of these cells gradually establish long histories with the Nibelungs and elsewhere. Not surprisingly, the morpheme's portion in contrabass and bassoons is a pair of erdachords. A hint of sexual lust which drives him to reach the maidens arises from Loge and from the Earth Mother. Simply by pursuing them, Alberich continues the process of dark evolution launched here, which eventually makes him and his race something quite other than what they've been to this point. It could be argued this is mere coincidence, for how else would the Meister have portrayed this initial scramble? The answer is, he could have done it in a virtually infinite number of ways, but chose this one to evolve his syntax consistently. This bundle's footprint here is brief, only a single additional iteration, as grousing at the slippery rocks the dwarf clambers towards Voglinde. His vocal begins by bobbling on chord notes, thirds, and reverse chord notes. After a single measure's wordless reprise of his personal morpheme, variants of its materials extend the episode as he sings a long falling scale followed by a series of four rising reverse melody note strophes, his desire to mate burning hot. This rising reverse melody note series is destined to become a signature module representing this very idea, if in the most unexpected context. The harmony shifts from logochromatics into diatonic yet still darkly minor chording, plentiful in clumsy graces, interspersed by turning demi-semiquaver cello figures capped with upward demi-semiquaver viola scales. In the midst of this, after a descending third, Alberich's vocal slides down another scale, contradicted at its end by a flip up a third. As a side note, Alberich's descending scales bear a strange resemblance to Wotan's spear, a duality that will be repeatedly emphasized later on in the tetralogy. Comical sneezing afflicts the dwarf during his minim dotted crotchet rest, his misery portrayed with onomatopoeic delight by continued viola scales, cello turns, and four horn oboe double strikes finished in strong woodwind impacts on downward sevenths, which Schulte's Gustav Neidinger punctuates with loud, perfectly timed sneezes. Over the last of these, the dwarf bounces down a third to leap up a sixth, capped by a plunging octave on his concluding word, Niesen. 
the horn woodwind hubbub doubling in speed along with the viola cello graces. Productions rarely do much with this sequence, taking it as a given audience accept its premise, however it's staged, despite the Meister emphasizing its unique narrative importance with his stage directions, text, and music. Universally ignored or sidestepped is how an air-breathing creature functions totally immersed in water, not to mention why he would even bother to do so. Chereau's centennial version set the precedent mostly favored ever since, playing the sequence in an air-breathing atmosphere. His hydroelectric dam inspired Slane Hoff's 1989 drawing room, later refined in 2006's Copenhagen Aquarium Saloon, and subsequent mountings have found their own symbolic rationales. 2008's Marinsky production is stylized until it knows no realistic locale, while Argentina in 2012 and Lisieux in 2014 offer quasi-realistic socialist designs which don't bother making so much as a stab at the Meister's original concept. Meanwhile, Kupfer's 1992 Bayreuth production opts for vague laser effects which may or may not be water, and Valencia's 2007 mounting, highly praised for its visuals, places its Rhine maidens before water-like projections where they gamble in transparent water-filled cubes, which only weakly suggest why Albert suffers such discomfort. In 2016, China and Vienna attempt to return to Wagner's original concept, but China's lush back wall projections and Vienna's yards of billowing green linen, respectively, meet with limited success. A rising cello arpeggio stills the clamor of Alberich sneezes, its caressing, rising, falling sign beneath Voglinde beckoning the dwarf, her loose variant of the lullaby tune with its own odd resemblance to the ring concluded by oboe softly pulsing a last comic sneeze module. As the cello line falls briefly silent, Alberich approaches her, rising a fourth into an a cappella inversion of the Erda melody's final notes, a detail which intuits the obvious, some weakening of or opposition to the rising module's fount of nature. He follows it with a variant with its emergent sense of heroic effort. Through woodwind cording, two cello arpeggios rise separated by a quaver pause, one each to introduce Velgunda's next two lines, her first bouncing down a third and up a fourth, the second as she confounds Albrecht's expectations by swimming out of reach. Violas portray the action with the rising wave followed by an upward chromatic scale, a figure passed to second violins which hand the wave to four consecutive iterations on firsts. As nymph and strings together reach the top of their arcs, the dwarf laments her departure by rising a third into a variant that underlines his heroic struggle to catch her. Soft woodwind cording sustains the passage, first and second violins trading waves as the dwarf pleads with Voglinda on a fourth descending into air to chord notes. Then, after a quaver's rest, he sings the epic's first reverse ash interval on a fifth, his complaint being she's made herself hard for him to follow. As the violin choirs trade sinking waves, he rises on melody notes to end by reversing them, and ascend an air to fourth, thus creating another heroic variant, as he protests her ease of movement beside his lack of it, his juxtaposition of the melody notes with their reversal to create a natural rising falling sign is a syntactic detail with massive impact on the epic's future one that awaits further comment as its meaning gradually coalesces its gist however is clear enough meaning sexuality with the last of these vocal fragments, Voglinde darts down closer to the dwarf, and the violin's wave descent passes through violas into cellos, sinking the module to their deepest register. Her taunt that he has a better chance now begins over the last second violin pulses with reverse melody notes capped by a downward fourth, then, after a quaver rest, chord notes leaping down a sixth into their reversal, and up a third into the notes again. The welter of chord note oppositions a clear sign of her intent to confound him. 
The cello's low register wave iterations, steady as Albrecht hurries to grasp her, his vocal begun on a rising third to intone the bravery cell, ending with a plunging fifth. She responds, bouncing down, then up fourths, rising through heroic melody notes to plunge cruelly on an octave as she finishes her taunt and darts out of reach. Her octave arrests cellos in a two-measure trill appoggiatura with its delicate charge of sexuality to support waves rising with her traded between second and first violins. This first mocking ends, along with her two sisters' static note laughter, on a sharp chord sting across woodwind and strings. Commentary tends to pigeonhole Rheingold as more primitive and less innovative than the tetralogy's later chapters. Yet this sequence alone, never mind the entire first scene, represents a sophistication unknown in Wagner's previous works, never mind the opera of his day. Its approach is cinematic, in a sense which, even in films, wasn't fully realized until the last decades of the 20th century, a dramatic aesthetic not so much as contemplated by live productions up to the time of these videos. The Meister's lament to his patron, King Ludwig II of Bavaria, that his 1876 premiere was nothing more than another poor child of the theater, rings especially true in this context, Focused on narrative and philosophy, ring analysts and those staging the work pay scant attention to the music's remarkably advanced theatrical devices. Those of Newman's mind are likely to dismiss the syntactic modules identified in these videos as mere tics, the Meister's atypical subconscious making vague connections which no normal mind can possibly grasp, much less decipher. Yet these embryonic rustlings exhibit so remarkable a consistency of meaning throughout the drama, I'm bound to note them in full all of which contribute to morphemes the analytic tradition has readily acknowledged from the time of Ozogen. For instance, atop three staccato string quaver punctuations, Albrecht now rails at Vogelinda's cruelty on two varied strophes as previously developed, the first of which, it should be noted, turns on a falling triad, the second an embryonic ghost of Freya's love module, his original fascination with their sporting turned bitter complaint. First violins and violas race up a furious sextuplet demi-semiquaver scale into a sting, which launches the dwarf's final epithet, the work's first inverted ash interval on a third, the word falsche on chord notes. Violins and violas echo this last module in a rising chain of four erda chord iterations, separated by quaver rests, whose traditional use in the 19th century to portray sadness, as Newman describes, is certainly apt here, even if there's a good deal more to that simple yet pungent module's use throughout the ring. These urgently building chords are swept aside in the blink of an eye by soft high woodwinds gently pulsing over a horn pedal chord. It's a striking change of mood as, with seductive cunning, Velgunda assumes the taunting duties. This sequence boils down to a pair of syntactic germs, combined and varied in the Meister's skillful modular fashion. The seventh harmony here converts the nymph's earlier taunts into an actual syntactic germ initiated by Velgunda's voice as she sketches falling rising tritones supported by flutes and slower contrary motion clarinet dotted crotchets. The tritone's wonted darkness is lightened by the enchantingly indeterminate harmony, her vocal turning the low ash interval back on itself to suggest these taunts for the hapless dwarf weaken the very natural integrity they're meant to guard. In her second pulse, Velgunda softens her appeal by shifting its tritone to a fifth, its low ash interval conclusion a gentle rising third, a sly reverse echo of Alberich's lust. Woodwinds buoy the second call to Alberich, varying Velgunda's slowed vocal tempo by telescoping its ash intervals into a wave-like motion, which alternates falling sevenths with rising ones, a palpable hint of Erda's underlying direction even in their seductive malice. 
Over the horn woodwind pedal, concluding the last measure, violins trade a pair of rising wave modules, after which the dwarf responds hopefully on melody notes, Belgunda answering with the developing quasi-heroic morpheme, as if to both hearten and discourage his struggle. As she does, violins continue trading waves, while the harmony shifts from its seventh tinge into a major mode cadential formula, complicated then completed by clarinets bassoons, in a vague sketch of the taunting modules, as the nymph beckons Alberich with a tangy bouquet of ironies, a hopeful rising fourth, ominous falling octave, and a pulse similar to that which will become the dwarf's bitter cry of disappointment, a nascent morpheme of vast importance to the drama, even if passing swiftly here. As her phrase closes on a sinking fifth, cellos glide up a semiquaver scale into a gentle sting, which shifts the harmony to minor mode, and leaves the dwarf praising his latest tormentor virtually a cappella, with only three string chord punctuations. He rises a third, into a foreshadowing of the ring, on a module whose consecutive melody note opposition also evokes the giant turn, another slowly developing syntactic mystery allied to sensual urges, a phrase he caps with a subtly ambivalent touch, bouncing up an air to fourth into another downward fifth. He presses what he feels is his just appeal endorsed by nature herself, with two yearning melody note pulses, separated by fourth bounces, down then up, the first resembling that chagrin module to hint he's fooling himself, the second even more hopeful, meaning without a falling interval. Winding cellos ascend in tentative waves as he calls the nymph down to him, voice rising a third into an inverted ash interval on an amorous falling seventh. Erda's gentle nudge and another pulse of chagrin to give his hopes the lie. Violins then violas spin the wave downward as Velgunda moves closer, singing melody notes to encourage his illusions, satirically gracing her last pitch. As cellos snake down from violas in distorted waves, he urges her to approach still further, with a melody note strophe to echo hers, yet ended rhythmically as a high ash interval tellingly ungraced. The loud woodwind string pedal chord topping his last note shifts back to dark minor seventh harmony as cellos begin a nervous chromatic wave distortion, an insidious chromatic turn underscoring his extended appeal for her physical charms. This, his longest, most specific statement of what he aches for in the Rhine Maidens, sports a text shockingly graphic for the 19th century, and is naturally enough fertile in nascent musical syntax. Alberic's vocal breaks down into three segments, an introduction followed by two roughly echoing phrases. He launches on a rising sixth with all that interval's poignance, then moves on by opposing reverse melody notes with their originals, another foretaste of the giant turn, as heard in his first vocal, whose implications of interracial sexuality grow ever more powerful as the drama unfolds, but whose repercussions must await for comment as they occur. He then falls on an even more heartfelt harmonically augmented sixth, which is all but a seventh. In the process, he echoes the nymph's earlier promise to teach him a lesson, inadvertently indicting his own hopes. This introduction leads to the echoing phrases, each begun on extended melody notes to move through flattened cribs of the Rhinebeaten's own frolicking shape, continued on reverse melody notes, a module also echoing his initial lusting vocal, the key to its meaning. Yet each of these two phrases ends differently. The first on chord notes, a sly reminder that his first reverse melody notes break across a pair of chord notes. His second echoing phrase extends itself on two reverse melody note pulses, whose third lift makes it a distorted pair of Flosshilda's heroic figure to echo his vocal's first strophe of that module. Over a rising cello arpeggio, his voice's terminal falling sixth precisely echoes that interval in its first phrase. Perhaps the most cryptic element of the passage seems to be a retrograde of the module of brave resistance. 
launched by a plunging fifth, the only one of its kind in the sequence, and continued on extended melody notes, it sets the word mit schmeichelnder Brunst, followed by the dwarf's most overtly physical reference, meaning to the nymph's breasts. This naturally aligns it with Alberich's hottest passion, and while it's no more than a passing shadow here, this syntactic module is destined to repeat continually throughout the tetralogy in slightly altered forms, its sense of dark fervor deepening until it becomes one of the work's pivotal syntactic elements. Remarkably, alone among commentators, only Cook identifies this evolving morphine, never mind appreciates its importance. But more on that when its meaning solidifies, which it most emphatically does. Beneath the dwarf's final descending sixth, cellos lift their arpeggio into violas, which take a single wave and hand it to second violins, sustained by woodwind chord pulses, trade it with firsts. This returns Velgunda to major mode, asking for a closer look at him on a caressing line built from extended melody notes, a typical Rhinemaiden bounce on thirds, and reverse melody notes. From this, she rises with languorous allure in a high world ash interval on a heroic fifth, leisurely stretched across the word minna. This passing detail is yet another brick added to a slowly growing syntactic edifice associating melody note reversals with some as yet undefined aspect of sexuality. Also, while distorted by phrasing, this module implies Foshilda's heroic cell, Velgunda slyly telegraphing her resistance. Then, after a quaver rest, her lingering trio of static E flats ends on chord notes, dripping satirical longing. As she eyes her dwarfish suitor, her suddenly harsh a cappella vocal passes through chord notes to fall a fourth into melody notes, marks of her natural aversion, the last brusquely graced to make it a second melody note pulse. Static violas precisely echo this module, their final note punched by a comic sforzando horn mute, as if she thrusts her face into his for a better look. Punctuated by tart quaver string pizzicati, her disgusted reaction is built almost entirely on the lullaby melody and reverse melody notes. Flute's clarinets race up a pair of waves into a sting reinforced by strings, and during Albrecht's sensual elation, she finishes with melody notes, a third lift, chord notes, and a repeat of the flattened turn from his own vocal. Out of a louder string woodwind sting, those same woodwinds rush down a diminished minor arpeggio, mirroring stage instructions for the dwarf to physically restrain her. His words punched with arco string quaver chords, he jumps a minor third into a heroic strophe on a rather flaccid third, then another lusting stroke, slithering down a scale with cellos, first violins alone chromatically ascend from it as she bounces up a third, then, after a crotchet rest, chirps a mocking lust strophe to launch three wordless measures as the nymph swims out of his reach. To depict her move, first violins puckishly distort the trademark wave, oboes initiate a sustained octavo trill, and clarinets flutes climb merrily on an erda strophe, which they follow with two iterations of its heroic portion, the final one pulsing its last notes on quavers doubled by the other two nymphs' laughter. It all ends with a sharp chord sting across the orchestra, the oboe trill finishing in its wanted appoggiatura to stir Alberich's sexually agitated response, pungent with syntax. The dwarf's vocal line is especially fertile. He begins his string of insults by following an extended version of the ring's first half, a module to gather powerful associations with Nimbalong racial dominance. In this instance, it's worth noting how the Meister partitions off its falling triad, another module whose import is closely allied to sexual racial issues. Albrecht continues on a distortion of his previous cell with its own sensual implications, to finish with a paired distorted hybrid of his personal morphine, which trades its reverse air to chord notes for a marginally stronger rising third. 
to make it something like Flosshilda's quasi-heroic cell. As significant, beneath him, two viola-cello erdichord strophes interweave two swifter chord note pulses on woodwinds. Falklander's taunting has been more extended and physically more intimate than Voglinder's, so it pushes the dwarf closer to that dramatic emotional shift, making possible the ring's theft, which this analysis maintains is exactly as Erda plans, hence her covert syntactic goading. Albrecht finishes his portrait of his own repulsive features, which he admits aren't glatt und glatt, by falling a minor third to leap up a major one, its top note contemptuously graced, a mark of his sexual emotional delight curdling. As a passing note, this juxtaposition of a falling third with a rising interval in a long short long rhythm is yet another module which looks forward to important syntax, in this case related to the dwarf's powers already hinted at in his lusting vocal, a module tellingly drawn from the nymph's characteristic lullaby bounce. With three emphatic punctuating quaver string chords, he rounds off his skull with an echo of his lust, ended after a third plunge and a quaver rest in a variant mocking the nymphs. First violins ascend in fuming chromatics, their second measure joined by oboes, a syncopated string pulse goading them, at whose crest a sensual rising harp arpeggio utterly transforms the mood. The staccato clarinet ghost of Rhinemaiden laughter become calm punctuations as Flosshilda, last and most respectable of them, seductively calls to the dwarf. The passage's relationship to the Meister's ideals on 19th century opera cliché are intriguing, but fall outside an analysis of syntax and narrative, while the passage's storytelling goes well beyond mere satire. Of the three maidens, Flosshilda's taunting is the most extended and intimate, whose pacific initial measures, as well as its main body, are meant to lull the dwarf back into docility after his two cruel rejections, making this the most hurtful rebuff of the three. Buoyed on these gentle woodwind pulses, she invites Alberich to try her instead of her sisters, lifting a third to descend on a triad resembling a lullaby cell as well as those already heard in the dwarf's vocal, a foretaste of the ring with its embryonic promise of sexual potency. From it she rises through melody notes, thus subtly contradicting the dwarf's lust with her natural prerogative against it. After a quaver crotchet rest, she continues in a caressing version of her heroic cell, shielding the goal being her covert motive here. A solo violin joins in as a florid romantic touch, though on a contrasting sensual chromatic reversal of the extended melody notes. Her vocal proceeds on a sensuous turn, leaping up a seductive sixth, its top note punctuated by an alluring harp arpeggio to initiate chord notes in beckoning dotted minims on the words die dritte, meaning herself, the flute pulses sounding the chords themselves, mark of the Earth Mother's continuing plan as it plays out in this final and cruelest of taunts. This subtle turning point is emphasized, along with the harp arpeggio, by clarinets resting on a minim crotchet chord, six second cellos initiating a long dampened pedal, and bassoons pulsing static notes under flutes. These woodwind pulses initiate a series of four chord chord note repetitions solo violin doubled by flute strophes, while Flosshilda's vocal falls distinctively on chord notes, finished with a descending fourth followed by another echo of her heroic cell, itself capped with the same chord note fourth echo, a kind of double refrain. The nymph falls silent, her final note launching an aching harmonic transition through minor back to major, Erda's footprint triggering seven first violins to join the solo for the next five chord note strophes, as with violas, six second violins take over the woodwind supporting pulses. 
This harmonic shift, with its most specific orchestration, is a sign of Albrecht's emotional ache, who answers the nymph by warbling a static ash interval, followed with extended reverse melody notes, themselves more syntactic foreshadowing. Easily disarmed by Flossilda's transparent flummery, after a dotted crotch at rest, he congratulates his luck over the last chord note strophe as violas and cellos launch five pulse measures, each like a wavering heartbeat that skips its first beat. Atop this pair of transitional measures, his vocal falls a third to rise in a precise inversion of the ring's initial falling line, then fall in its initial form, his trust still not fully established. This rising-falling ring opposition, never mind the triad modules they include, are more syntactic details to have vast impact on the work's overall syntax, and, if they're presently no more than unconscious ticks, it's still remarkable they should sound in this particular narrative context, since Albrecht praises himself on what he believes is a sexual coup, a delight which turns out to be tragically misplaced, with terrible consequences not merely for him, but the entire world. His vocal continues on two phrases, which, though not identical, create the impression of a song-like question and answer. An upward leaping six leads both, the first bouncing through an echo of his previous wooing of Velgunda, capped by chord notes exactly as it is in the previous vocal. The second, an elongated falling scale, its last pitch reinforced as those same chord notes. Finishing his self-flattery, he asks the nymph to prove herself by coming closer. His phrase, begun on melody notes, concluded with another falling scale dovetailed into a half-brave, half-lustful strophe. Ironically, his own echo of Flossilda's previous call to defend the gold. This last module punctuated by only two soft quaver string chords. On his final note during a wordless two measures, first violins snake down through a woodwind pedal on a pair of wave iterations, which become a falling scale, all of it depicting Flosshilda's swim down to Alberich. The violin's continuous, low-winding turn built from waves extends another two measures to then continue unbroken, while she satirically chides her sister's coldness, rising on reverse chord notes into a static ash interval, a plunging fifth and poignant rising sixth, followed by extended reverse melody notes. She caps this phrase, doubled for emphasis by clarinets bassoons harmonized in thirds, on reverse chord notes elided to the dwarf's angry Rhinemoden variant, that rises a seventh into a swift chord note grace on its upper tone. First violin waves past the violas, which break them into three fitful downward scale fragments, as low woodwinds subtly insinuate a pair of aerid chords. The vala's covert influence thus drives Alberich's heartened response, bouncing on three reverse chord note pulses, the last capped by extended reverse melody notes to lift on original melody notes into the melody's heroic conclusion, then fall on more extended reverse melody notes, a host of ambivalent hints, all immersed in the earth mother and complicated by race and sexuality. The nymph's lovemaking parody resumes as second violins linger in close, wave-like turns initiated by violas in the last measure of the dwarf's phrase, while firsts begin doubling her vocal on the second of its pair of static ash intervals, the first prepared by a rising fifth, the second finished by a plunging one, to suggest the ambivalence of what she's about. Her vocal bundle concludes lifting a minor third into a held note as first violins slide down extended reverse melody notes lusciously chromatic into a second iteration of that reverse chord note pulse and graced Rhine Maiden variant, again doubled by clarinets bassoons at a third, which she in turn doubles vocally, a puckish upward grace on what is now a rising third. This time, for still greater emphasis, first violins double its melody, complete with chord notes at the top, and Alberich responds, his zeal swelling. As he rises into his line on reverse chord notes, violas take over the wave, their chromatics mirroring the fire of his love. 
mir zart sucht und zert sich das Herz. He vents this Logate-driven passion on a pair of melody notes. The first halting by being fractured with quaver rests, the second's initiation on a tritone descent, making it an echo of his lust for Velgunda. After a quaver rest, he intones another crib on that earlier vocal to sink on those extended reverse notes, gradually acquiring associations with the toils of love. Violas slide down chromatically under his wooing pulse, then, with his next variant, slither up a brief loge evocation to introduce Flosshilda as she voices one of the passage's most revealing syntactic bundles. Her vocal consists of two echoing song-like phrases, each launched on erda melody notes to pass through a distinctive figure built from chord note oppositions and a descending air to fourth, to rise a third, capped by more chord notes. Her second pulse adds reverse chord notes to make its introductory line extended melody notes, a thoroughly ambivalent bundle. While the elements of satire are obvious, parroting a grand operatic love duet from the 1840s, this is nevertheless a crucial syntactic packet that irrevocably assigns the emotions it characterizes with the Earth Mother against whom Alberich soon rebels, just as Wotan has done before him by seizing the World Ash branch. The line's notable figure is an embryonic version of Freya's second module, one destined to be the epic's most prominent love morpheme, primarily associated with the Velsung twins Siegmund and Sieglinde. Cook opines it first appears embryonically in Rheingold only a few moments after this, when Albrecht voices his anguish over Flosshilde's ill-treatment. Certainly, it's more noticeable there when it's closely aligned to its final evolution, yet Flosshilde's module predates it, a distinctive form already hinted at several times in scene one's previous episodes, now further solidified in Flosshilde's vocal. While these ideas are complex, all an audience need take away at this moment is a sense of the yearning for love threatened by the inevitable frustration hanging over it. This sly lampoon concludes as an infant dwarf exchange two pairs of sweet nothings, their descending vocal lines both announced and echoed by low woodwinds on chromatic scales oozing libidinously downwards. Flosshilda's vocals are identical reverse melody notes capped by reverse chord notes, while Albrecht first intones a falling triad in chord notes, which his second response makes into swifter reverse melody notes and chord notes, producing a squashed pulse that echoes his lust into the bargain. It should be noted that, however comical this passage, it's the closest Albrecht ever comes to experiencing anything remotely similar to love with another living creature, a fact to be recalled as the reverse melody notes and falling triad continue to solidify their more definitive sexual racial import throughout Rheingold. But here his dream of bold sensual conquest ends. A brusque procession of sharp woodwind horn quaver chords on first and middle beat of each measure, echo of Velgunda's earlier imprecations, support Flosshilda as she sings an acerbic echo of her earlier playfulness, launched by a low ash interval on reverse chord notes, followed by a plunging fourth and chord notes. This, of course, produces a close duplicate of the embryonic morpheme in her satirical wooing further rooting it in our minds, if only subconsciously. After a quaver rest, her backhanded compliments increase on melody notes, lifting into a heroic strophe which, it should be noted, also outlines an up-down sign opposing that in Albrecht's earlier wooing, yet another developing module allied to sexual racial urges. After another quaver rest and reverse chord notes, she twice in succession repeats the heroic cell, the last flattened by ending on another reverse chord note pulse, her resistance to the dwarf growing ever more obvious in both text and syntax. 
now punctuated by two angry falling viola scales after another quaver rest singing reverse notes she repeats her wooing melody almost verbatim only to cap it with her defiance the viola scales reverse themselves and after another quaver rest her passion grows on reverse chord notes a falling third and a leap up a strident tritone into still another heroic strophe that ends on a plunging fifth as violas slither down a chromatic scale floss hilda's contempt stiffens with two back-to-back -back rising falling melody note reversal arcs opposed to the dwarf's earlier falling rising one now doubled for emphasis by woodwinds she hurries on lifting with reverse chord notes into a low ash interval on the same reverse chord notes only to repeat her resistance ubiquitous in her taunts this phrase also represents a third iteration of that Alberich opposing sign, confirming the two as emerging morphemes drawn from those sign oppositions dominating the prelude. Woodwinds rise in thirds through five pulses of melody note reversals, a vicious syntactic jibe at the dwarf's sexual aspirations. With the fourth of these, after a quaver pause, her contempt climaxes, bouncing down a third and up a fifth into a final heroic pulse, capped by acidly lingering chord notes. As a side but indicative note, launching and beneath her last phrase, cello's contrabasses return with three strophes of that plunging octave thump which invests Alberich's first appearance with a good deal of its menace. On Flosshilda's terminal card notes, violas slide up chromatically into high woodwind chords that pulse in static tandem with the other two nymphs' derisive laughter. Out of this, the dwarf shark rises a cappella on reverse chord notes into a distortion of the nymph's innocent lullaby, now complicated by his frustrated lust and their cruel responses. He's answered by first violins that atop a coquettish trill appoggiatura rise through a semiquaver triplet scale into a string waver sting. Also a cappella, Flosshilda puts the nail in her mockery by tripping up a fourth to drop through reverse heroic melody notes, meaning ending on a plunging third, then rise on a sardonic fifth, which she finishes by writing atop three cadential woodwind waver punctuations with a slight truncation of the dwarf's embryonic reversal of her heroic cell, a nascent morpheme whose importance continues acquiring its deeper meaning thanks to this last and cruelest rejection. It has company in this last phrase of Flosshilda's taunt, whose third-fifth bounce running throughout has its precursor in the nymph's prior warning. First violins slide up two wave measures, each capped by a rising chromatic scale, the second underscoring Voglinda and Velgunda's final static laughter pulses, cut short as Voglinda rises on reverse chord notes by Alberich's bitter complaint, one of the epic's prominent watershed moments. Commentators from Newman to Millington to Cook find the air to chord notes in the wharf's cry of Veja. Possibly it's the harsh woodwind horn diminished seventh echoes following each chord note strophe in Alberich's vocal, which alert them, though they don't acknowledge those. Even so, the passage is laden front to back with chord note pulses and chord intimations, dominating its every part. There are other elements, however, several of which receive further attention when, during the scene 2-3 interlude, the Meister fashions its telling first sequence from this passage. A heroic rising fifth separates the dwarf's chord note sobs of Veja while he cries O Schmerz, O Schmerz to reverse melody notes, built from a pair of chord note strophes, his urge to be bitterly frustrated. Cook also mentions the double iterations of Freya, whose multiple iterations suggest it too has the potential for modular development. This proves true, but only later, during the Scene 2-3 interlude. More to the point here, and as previously discussed, that morpheme has sounded various times during earlier Scene 1 episodes, most prominently during Flosshilda's mock wooing, in order that its budding associations might culminate with greater impact at this pivotal moment. 
Albert starved hunger for love motivates his theft as much as, if not more than, the symbolic baggage of greed favored by allegorists. While it can be said emotional sexual longing is a kind of greed, it's from an entirely different class from lust for possessions and power. This one passage sets forth the psychological break separating those two different sorts of cravings, the trauma that kills love so makes possible the rape of the gold in order to forge the ring. Of course, this doesn't exclude greed from Alberich's mentality, since, in one important sense, the dwarf's anguish turns on his frustrated procreative urge, linking bitter emotional deprivation to an aching physical need, an idea subtly underlined by the chromatic slide in his vocal, Loge's erotic charge punched by the downward slither of chromatic bass notes, underlining powerful string air chord intimations. It should also be stressed his vocal line includes two overlapping reverse melody note strophes, cells that play important roles in the dwarf's struggles, his wooing, and its frustration. The scene as a whole revolves around Alberich's extraordinary pains in romancing creatures which are manifestly unsuited to him. If the Rhine Maidens are cruel, the undeniable truth is that a Nibelung dwarf should look elsewhere for a mate. This brings up a question never asked, but apt at this juncture, meaning what such a creature is doing at the bottom of a river. Never mind the physical impossibility which the Meister attempts to solve by requesting a bubble of air on the river bottom, something with which stage directors never bother. Even so, the implication is Albrecht must be chronically hapless in love, with this incredible expedient his last resort, and this in turn suggests he's driven by a lust so fiercely determined it's battered through a riverbed to slake itself. Love can be chased, of course, but not in this case. The dwarf only just sets eyes on the Rhine Maidens, with no time to develop the complex of understanding, attachment, and mutual respect associated with the term agape, meaning empathetic love. His feelings, intense as they might be, are also indiscriminate. He'll take whichever nymph he can get, all three if he can, and that's the very essence of greed. Mill we'll leave the hapless dwarf's revenge until the next video which picks up where this one leaves off in Dover's full score on the second stave of page 38. As always, thanks for watching, and please do leave your comments below. Time and energy allowing, I'll do everything I can to respond. Lastly, as all YouTubers know, your subscription to this channel by itself is a huge assist in completing this vast project. Hit the bell to be notified of the next videos. With luck and your support, there's a lot more to come.